speech, which terrified me because I had no time to think of one. Then I found out why it's just an end of duty or you're going to end of duty. That's a lot easier. And uh, I don't have to make a speech, which means I don't have to know anything, and you don't have to record by listening to me go on endlessly. So I'm going to say, go, guys, whatever you say. Okay, we're all going to make it here. We're going to have a lot of time. All right. So, Stan, how come you're here as a last minute guest at the convention and we're squeezing you in the first thing on Saturday morning? Well, well how I'm, always, that work out? I'm always a last minute guest. Nobody in their right mind would invite me early because I might show up. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to have been uh, on a tour in Norway and Sweden and Poland for some reason that escapes me at the moment. And then when they found out that I was nearby, everyone said, if you're going to be there causing trouble, why not come to London and cause some trouble too? So I said, okay, I love London. My wife is English. We, we come here every chance we can. So she's out shopping at the moment, which means I have to get out of here real fast while we still have some money left. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I, I, I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm going to tell you. Well, I got a lot of more. We tour in Europe for that part of your uh, Mr. Marvel, or is this a, a pleasure tour? Oh, no, it's never a pleasure tour. <laughs> it's a pleasure I stay home and read comic books. So you're no. promoting so much, man? <laughs> yeah, well, talking about Marvel, apparently they, they still seem to care about us in the other countries, and they wanted me to come over and talk to uh, reporters and television and whatever. And, uh, they, they like to live dangerously. But so far, I haven't started in the and everything is going pretty well. Uh, the best thing, the most fun thing was I was on MTV last night. I don't know if any of you thought they would get some of you. We, we set television back a couple of decades in the back of this, but it was funny to me. And they showed a little video game on the show with Spider-Man. The little cartoon figure of Spider-Man flying, shooting his webs. I loved it. I didn't have the heart to tell the guy that Spider-Man doesn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of videos, I gather there's an X-Men animated series. Um, is that one of the things that's big in your life at the moment? Yeah, we're just, we're just finishing it. We're doing a 13-episode X-Men animated series. It goes on television in the States next month, in October. And um, what we try to do is make it as close to the X-Men book as possible. You know, most of these animated series, they, uh, they change the characters a lot. I don't know if any of you saw a recent Spider-Man series a few years ago where the network insisted that Spider-Man have a girlfriend and a cute little dog because they said you can't have a successful series of animated cartoons without a cute little dog and the guy has to have a girlfriend and they did that. But with the X-Men, we're doing it just the way it is in the books. In fact, the 13 episodes are actually, while the stories are more or less complete in themselves, the episodes are continuous. It's one story with cliffhanger endings and everything. It'll either be a great success or the biggest flop ever to hit television. And uh, obviously, I hope it'll be a success. I hope it gets here soon. I hope you enjoy it. If you don't, don't let me know about it. If you do, write us a lot of letters. Okay, um, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that later. Um, you've kind of preempted my first question here, which is what do you do with your time these days? I don't have any time. <laughs> um, are you based in LA? Still? Yeah, I'm, I'm still living in LA. I've been in LA for about the past 10 or 12 years. And um, in fact, we just changed the name of my little organization, which consists of me and a couple of secretaries. It's not a big organization, but my operation is now called Marvel Films, which I think sounds so tremendously impressive. And uh, it's my job to look after all our film and television projects, many of which are beginning to come together now. You know, it's a funny thing. Marvel has been doing pretty well over the years, but I feel as if we're really just beginning now. I, I feel now the way I felt in the 1960s, when we were starting with Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and the Hulk, and we knew we were on to something pretty good. Well, right now, there are so many movies in the works based on Marvel characters and a couple of television shows. We have Marvel London now doing what I think are such dynamic books, and the characters are going to interface with the characters in the States. And our characters from the States are going to guest star in the Marvel UK books here. 
And we have our new series of Marvel uh, 2099 coming along, which we hope will establish a whole new universe. And good old Tom DeFalco, our titanically talented editor-in-chief, and his staff have a million new ideas for our regular characters and new series that will intermesh with other series and new surprises. And it's, it's really a very exciting time for us. And the fact that comics are becoming so big in England and in the rest of Europe, in fact, around the world, they're getting bigger and bigger. And it's like nobody knows where it's going to end, but it's really fun going along for the ride. And all of a sudden, why am I making a speech? You have a question. I'm glad you are. Uh, one of that ties in with uh, another one of my questions. Comic books obviously have come a long way since he started out in business. And since Martin Goodman started the original company which evolved into the, the marvel that we know today. Um, how come you got into the business in the first place? And what was the business like in those days? Was it a lot smaller? I guess it had a lot less respect in those days than it does now. Oh, the business when I got into it, and we've won back 50 years. It was much smaller. Funny thing is, it was a smaller business, but we were turning out bigger magazines. I think the comic books uh, in the early, really early days were about 64 pages. And uh, the publishers were people who knew very little about comic books. Most of them were guys who were from other businesses or from the publishing business, but they had, like my publisher at the time, he also published movie magazines, sport magazines, so-called men's magazines and pulps. And it just, he learned that somebody was doing a couple of comics and they seemed to be selling. And he said, that seems easy, let's do some comics. And we didn't even have our own staffs. There were companies that we would buy the comics from and just print them. And uh, you asked how I got into it. There's an ad in the paper. It said publisher, it said assistant pointed in a publishing company. I didn't even know it was a comic book company. And I applied for the job. I must have been the only guy who applied because they hired me. And um, I found out coincidentally when I got there, the place was owned by a cousin-in-law of mine, a guy who was married to my, to my cousin. And he saw me in the hall one day. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I work here. He uh, went to him back a little bit. Anyway, I was about 16 at the time, and Jack Kirby and his then partner, Joe Simon, we're the only two people on staff, and Joe was the editor, and Jack was the writer, and, I'm sorry, was the artist, and both Joe and Jack were writing Captain America and a few other stories. And uh, shortly thereafter, they got fired for some reason that I don't even remember. But uh, uh, Martin Goodman, the publisher, said to me, because I was the only guy there, he said, hey, Stan, can you handle the editing until I hire a real person? You know, 16 years old. Well, when you're 16, what do you know? I said, sure, I can do it. And um, he apparently forgot about me because I stayed in the job ever since. And uh, I always thought it would be a temporary job because comics, nobody cared about comics in those days. In fact, when people said, what do you do? You're always embarrassed to say, I'm in the comic book business. I'd meet somebody at the party, at a party, and They'd say, what do you do? I'd say, I'm a writer, and I'd start walking away, and they'd call me and say, what do you write? I still try to escape. I'd say, I write uh, stories for young people, and I'd start to walk away, grab me by the collar. What stories? Uh, in magazines. What magazine? Finally, I had to say comic books, and they'd walk away like I had to play. <laughs> of course, now it's different. Now people see me in, across the room at a party, and they say, excuse me, Michael Jackson, go away, Madonna, isn't that Stanley of Marvel? Well, not exactly, you get the idea. How much have really changed? Yeah, but it must have been a pretty exciting time, though, because the comics were really version, weren't they? They were kind of exploding in the, in the uh, about 1940-41, after the initial success of Superman and Batman. And they were exploding, but not the way they are now. By that I mean, we were selling more and we were producing more and there were a lot of companies in the business. And it was, very new. It was a very new thing. It was new, moment. but we didn't have any reaction. There were no fans. There were no conventions. There were no letters to the editor. There was nothing like that. It was like, years ago I did a radio show and I 
used to sit and talk into the microphone, and I used to say, I'm talking, but how do I know if anybody is listening? Is anybody, I could be talking to myself for all I know. And people on radio occasionally get that feeling. Well, it was that way in the comics. I mean, we were writing stories and publishing them, but did anybody care? We never got any feedback. And as a matter of fact, until the early 60s, when we started with the um, Fantastic Four Hulk, Spider-Man, and the rest, there had never been any real uh, fan mail. I, I always say, we sometimes we get a letter, and it would say something like, I bought one of your magazines, and there's a staple missing, and the pages fell out. I want my dime back. <laughs> and I would take that letter and hang it up on the bulletin board. I'd say, we got a fan letter! Everybody would be so excited. But it was only when, when Marvel, as far as I'm concerned, from my point of view, when Marvel started coming along, that the fan mail started, and the fan club started, and then we at the Marvel staff started getting invited to speak at colleges and high schools. And that, to me, is when it really got exciting. I mean, now, to be able to sit and talk to people who read the books and who know the books and it's sharing something. We didn't have that years ago. Okay, you didn't get that kind of fan feedback, but you got feedback from what sold well and what didn't sell well and what things didn't sell well and what the superheroes in 1940 lost in maybe one issue and disappeared again, which Joe Simon and Jack Kirby from lots of different superheroes. And then along came Captain America. Now, he was something different, wasn't he? Because he sold like hot cakes. Um, he's lost a lot of than one issue. You've been associated with Cap for a long, long time, right through. And of course, he did have his own fan clubs and he had his uh, sentiments of liberty, hymns, and all that kind of stuff. And what, what, to what would you attribute the credits, the success at that time, really, and perhaps the enduring success, but the success at that time of Cap? What, what made him different from uh, the Masked Terror or someone who'd been there last week? Well, I think, first of all, uh, the, the main reason success of Captain America was the fact that it was written and drawn so beautifully by Simon Kirby. Uh, there was a, an excitement and a power to the script. It's been hard to duplicate. But the other reason, which is equally, if not more valid, is the fact that he came out at the time when it looked as though the world was going to go to war, when Hitler was the great enemy, and Captain America, or well, most of the stories involved Captain America fighting the Nazis. So it was really the right character for the right time. When you mentioned the club, the Captain America fan club, that's not quite the same thing I was referring to because we ourselves started the club. You see, the fan clubs I was talking about are the clubs that are started by people out there without anything to do with us. But at any rate, um, as proof of the fact that Captain America was really a product of his time. After the war ended, the sales dropped. In fact, we gave the book up. We dropped the book because nobody was buying it. I don't know what year it was, but some period after the war. We tried to revive Captain America again, once or twice, because I always liked the name, I liked the character, I loved his uniform, and it never really worked. And it wasn't until we started Marvel Comics and brought Captain America back in the Avengers that it took hold and everything has been fine ever since. But we never could really make a success of it after the war, after World War II. Yeah. Um, he really, I think I'm right in saying that he really was the first hero, not quite the first, but to take on the Nazis in that way. I know Submarine and the Torch had taken on the Nazis a few months before Cap came on. But um, to what extent do you think Martin Goodman Personally, with, uh, did his feelings, anti-Nazi feelings, uh, at a time when many people in America were isolationists and didn't want anything to do with war, do you think Goodman's feelings personally helped to inspire Captain America or, or, or Joe or Jack? Well, it was, it, obviously, if Martin Goodman didn't agree, he would let us do it. But I think, yeah, there were some isolationists in the country, but the whole, the whole country was really anti-Nazi. I mean, this was a feeling that was shared by 95%. We all felt that way. So it wasn't just Martin, and it wasn't just the artist or the writer or me or the others. It was, it was all of us. It, it's been said uh, before now that, that part of that might have been because uh, a lot of 
Jewish people were from all. I think we're from that background, and of course they perhaps had more reason than most to appreciate well, what's going on. Yeah, that's very true, but as I say, uh, in those times, the whole country was really uh, against the Nazis. It wasn't just the Jewish people. And there weren't enough Jewish people to make us go to work. Now, Martin Goodman, of course, died quite recently, and that's very sad, but uh, it, it was good to see that very respectful uh, obituaries in the British press. Now, all the major British papers gave him the obituary, and indeed, uh, yeah. And indeed, they gave uh, Joe Schuster, who also died quite recently, uh, pretty good obits. Oh, does that happen in the States now? Do the major papers give obits to oh, sure. the great men of the homies? Joe Schuster, that was really a tragic thing. There was the fellow who had drawn Superman, co created. Jerry Siegel, and they never really got the recognition they deserved, I guess, except from some fans. It was, it was very tragic that uh, they never, there was, there never seemed to be a place for them in the comic book business after Superman. I know I had met Jerry Siegel, the writer, some years later, and he came up to see me at Marvel. I was amazed to find out that he needed a job. And uh, we didn't really have any jobs, but I made one for him. And he was damn good. And we gave him a job writing copy, proofreading, doing some assistant editing. And he was talented. He was good. I was glad we hired him. But then he had problems with his health, and he had to move to the coast, to the west coast, where it was warmer, right the best food. So we lost track of him, except for getting a Christmas card from him every year to send him He's still out there. I've got to try to see him sometime. I never met Joe Schuster, but in both their cases, it was tragic that they never got more recognition from the industry. Yeah, I think we'd all agree about that. Um, okay, in the, yeah, in the 50s, you mentioned 1953, 1954, uh, Human Torch, Submarine, and Captain America all revived, and they didn't work. Um, you were very closely involved with that scripting, certainly Captain America, John Lennon, John Lennon, John Lennon, John Lennon. Clearly, trying to replace the, uh, the, the fervent anti-Nazi feeling in the strip and in its audience with an anti-Holland feeling, and that didn't didn't pan out, did it? Really? Oh, it panned out beautifully. We had many no, many stories that were any. You see, everything depends on the time. There was a time when, in America, and I assume here, we felt that the communists were really serious, deadly enemies of ours. And when we felt that way, we used them as villains in a lot of our stories. After a while, we got a little more sophisticated and we realized that you can't just take a whole group of people and say they're bad guys. And we stopped doing it. But at the time that we were doing it, and again, we did it at the time that certainly everybody in America felt that way, the way they did about the Nazis. <coughs> and the book style was all fine. And uh, then we went up. We decided later on that we were going to stop branding any one group of people. It wasn't right, it wasn't fair, we wouldn't do anything that had to, where, where the villains were people of a certain race, of a certain religion, of a certain nationality. And we have tried to keep that. It has to be said that the books didn't last that long in the 50s. Somehow it wasn't the right time, you say, at the time it wasn't quite right. Well, there were a lot of other reasons the books didn't last as long. I don't know if you're aware of that. There was a time that the management of our company made a real bonehead mistake. We used to distribute our own magazines. And for some reason, our publisher decided that he would not distribute his own, his own magazines, but he would let a company called the American News Company distribute our books. So we put all our books in the basket of the American News Company. And a few weeks later, the American News Company went out of business. And there we were with all our books and nobody to distribute them. For some reason that I won't bore you with, we weren't able to do our own again. Once we stopped doing it, we could start again. And we had to, the only people we could get to distribute our books were our top competitors, the publishers of Superman and Batman. <laughs> they said they would distribute our books for us, but we had been publishing, I don't know, 30 or 40 books a month, maybe more. They said, we will only take eight books a month. 
So we had to drop from 30 to 40 down to eight books a month in order to just even stay in business. Now that might have been one of the times that you would and other people would have thought, gee, their, their books aren't selling and they dropped a lot. And it wasn't because they weren't selling, it's because we had no need to distribute them. Okay, so obviously the time was right when uh, Fantastic Four and Spider-Man burst on the scene. I thought you'd never get to this. <laughs> so what was right about the time then? How come? Well, maybe it was to do with, uh, you've got your own distribution back, I don't know, but how come that worked out so well then? I don't think it was the time that was right. I think the time was always there. I think the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and all our others would have sold 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. We just never thought to do those kind of books, I mean, before 30 years ago. Um, what happened really, all those years, I had been doing the books the way Martin Goodman wanted me to do them. He believed that comics were just for young children. And he used to say to me, I want you to keep the story simple. I don't want continued stories. I don't want you to use any words that a child won't be able to understand. No words of more than two syllables. And no complex plots, all those things. And I totally disagreed, but he was the boss. I wanted to earn a living and be paid every week. And I kept, every so often I'd say to my wife, you know, Joni, I've really got to quit and get another job because I'm not happy with what I'm doing. I don't like what we're writing. Well, this went on for about like 20 years. Finally, she said, Stan, if you're so unhappy with what you're writing and you want to quit, why don't you do some books the way you would like to do them? And if Martin doesn't like them, he'll fire you. And so what? You want to quit anyway, but at least you'll get it out of your system. Well, it just happened that at that time, he asked me if I would do a group of superheroes because he had met the publisher of DC Comics, which at that time I think was called National Comics. And that publisher had told him on the golf course, I think, that they had a book called The Justice, I never know if it's Justice Society or The Justice League. Do you remember? Somebody in the audience says, I think it's The Justice League. Probably The Justice League. They had a book called The Justice League, which was four heroes, and it was selling very well. So Martin said, why don't we do a group of heroes? Maybe this is the time for it. So I figured, okay, I'm going to do the one book the way I would like to do it. So I made up the Fantastic Four, and I decided that instead of having secret identities, everyone would know who they are. Instead of the girl just being a token female who uh, the hero always had a rescue, she'd be part of the group. In fact, I thought it would be fun if she would be engaged to be married to the hero, not just his girlfriend. Uh, we always felt we had to have a teenager. I didn't, but Martin did, and he was still the boss. So I put in a teenager, but I figured I'm going to make him fight on a teenager. He'd rather work on his car than go fighting criminals, and he was interested in girls. And he'd say things like, I'm not getting paid enough money to go risking my life to do all this. And I decided to get one of the members to be an ugly monster kind of guy that we could have some humor with, who could always be fighting with the teenager. And I did all the things that I knew Martin really wouldn't want. And then I tried to get them to talk as much as possible like real people. Um, and they didn't always win, and they weren't always successful, and they had problems. And I said, I don't want costumes. I hate costumes. If I were a superhero, I wouldn't walk around in some stupid, colorful costume with skin-tight shorts and stuff. So I put them out without costumes. Well, that was when we started getting fan after the first issue, we got hundreds, thousands of letters from readers who said, we love it, we want to buy every issue, but we'll never buy another one unless you give them costumes. And that taught me a great truth, something that to this day I don't understand. But the readers of superhero comics want their heroes to wear costumes. And if any of you who are psychology majors Know the reason for that. I'd appreciate you writing to me and letting me know. 
one of the world's great mysteries. But at any rate, the book sold, and then Martin said, let's do another one, Stan, you're on a roll. So I, again, I wanted to do something different, and I thought it would be fun to do a hero who's a monster. I, I remember the Frankenstein movies, and I always thought, you know, Boris Karloff, that first one, I always thought that the monster was really the hero. He didn't want to hurt anybody, but those idiots who torches were always chasing them up and down the hills and everything. So I thought, I'm going to get a monster who's a good guy, a misunderstood good guy. And then I remember Jekyll and Hyde. I had always liked that. I thought it would be fun if he changes back and forth. So we came up with the Hulk. Remembering that you had to have a costume. Now, I couldn't figure out how to give a, a monster a costume that would look silly. But I figured I'll give him different color skin. That'll be always the same. So I decided to color his skin gray. And in the first issue, he was gray. I thought that looked kind of mysterious and menacing. But the printer couldn't get the gray color consistent. It, on one page, it was light gray. On one page, it was dark gray. On one page, it looked black. I hated the way it came out. And the people who saw the book said, gee, does, don't you guys know what color his skin is? <laughs> so I figured I'll pick another color for the second issue. I figured nobody's going to notice, nobody cares. <laughs> so, I thought, what other color can I use? What color is not being used at the moment? And I looked around at other superheroes and I realized there weren't any green ones. And I figured, okay, I'll make them green. <laughs> it was a fortuitous choice because uh, it, it enabled me to use a lot of the corny expressions that I have grown to love, like the jolly green giant and the green Goliath, and I love playing with words that way. And that was the hope. So then, my publisher again said, because that sold pretty well, let's do another one. So I figured again, now I think I told you I hate teenagers. No, I don't hate teenagers. <laughs> I hate teenage sidekicks. I always used to wonder why Captain America had to run around with Bucky or Batman had to have Robin trailing after him. I mean, if I were a superhero, I wouldn't want a teenager with me all the time. You know, at the very least, people would talk. <laughs> so anyway, I figured, just for fun, I'm going to get a teenager who's a hero, but I'm going to do it my way. He's not going to be the greatest guy in the world. He's going to have a million problems. And just because he's a superhero, that doesn't mean he'll be rich. I don't know if you remember, but years ago, None of the superheroes worried about money. They had all the money they needed. If they wanted to build something, they built it. If they wanted to have a secret hideout in some place that would have cost $100 million, they had the hideout. Nobody thought about where do they get the money. So I figured this guy is going to have to earn a living. And then I figured, let's give him a family. I figured, how about a nice widowed aunt that he has to worry about? Some old woman who's always getting sick. No hero of anything. And I figured, let's give them all kind of the ills that human flesh is heir to, like dandruff and acne and ingrown toenails. And he, he gets an allergy attack when he's fighting crooks and his costume clothes. And the more I thought about it, I was having fun with it. I said, oh, this would be great. So then I had to think of a power for it. Well, obviously, with superheroes, the most important thing is the power. So I figured we already had the strongest guy in the world, the Hulk, and we had the thing in the Fantastic Four. We had a guy who had burst into flame and fly. We had an invisible girl. We had a guy with body stretch who modestly called himself Mr. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, I figured, what's left? And I have told this story so many times, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I made it up or if it's true. <laughs> I'm beginning to think it's true because I've said it so often, so, you know, I'll tell it again. But there I was trying to think of an idea, and I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And I said to myself, hey, how about a hero who can crawl on the wall? So that, I like that idea, so that was different. Then I figured, now I need a name for it. So it looked like an insect, so they call him Insect Man, but that didn't sound dramatic. But how about Mosquito Man? <laughs> And then I remembered years ago when I was a kid, it may have been years ago that was, there was a magazine I used to read, it wasn't a comic book, it was called a pulp magazine called The Spider, Master of Men. And he was just a detective who wore a hat and a little 
face mask. I think, I'm not sure, but something like this. He had a ring, and when he hit the villain, it would leave the mark of a spider on the guy's face when he hit him. That's why they called him the spider. Anyway, as a 10-year-old kid, that always seemed so dramatic to me. And I thought, gee, why don't I call him Spider-Man? And of course, the rest is history. <laughs> Okay, it certainly is. Um, I'm going to hand over to the audience so because these people have been very patient. <laughs> they need that to uh, But I'm going to ask you one more question. Of all the artists you've worked with for a long career, who is your favorite artist to work with? There is no way on earth I will ever answer that question. <laughs> Can you imagine me naming any artist and the other 500 of them reaching me? <laughs> no, I, I've enjoyed them all. They've all been fantastically talented. Some of them were better at some things, some better at other things. Uh, some drew action scenes magnificently. Some were great at expressions and characterization and the layout. They, they all, I've never been a believer in who's the best. You know, I don't even like the Academy Awards and the Emmys and things like that. I, I never feel it's fair. Um, but I've been very lucky that all the people I've worked that's a great answer. Before I throw a question to the audience, I just want to say this book is an invaluable source of reference material about Marvel. Obviously, it's very highly biased towards Marvel, but uh, no Marvel should be without. <laughs> <laughs> Plug over. <coughs> Sorry, welcome in. Yeah, it's like something. Um, Thank you. Plug over. Sorry, welcome in. We have to plug something. So the questions are now open to you. I'm sure that some of you can come up with something to ask Stan and Matt. When I speak, what I say is so complete. <laughs> okay, well, that's it. All right, this guy in the front row. Is there any chance of Patrick's ending in the regular series? Well, I don't think it's planned at the moment. The, the question was, well, is there any chance of Powell Patrick turning into a series? I can never say no to anything, because as soon as we get an editor or a writer who says, let's bring back Powell Pack, we will. Now, we are discussing doing Power Pack as a movie and as a television series. I don't know if it will be done, but there are people interested. So certainly, if we bring it out as a movie or a TV series, we will, of course, bring out the book. There's always a chance of it. Yeah. Where did you drive What about it? All right, the question is, what about Ravage 2099, and what about Spider-Man the movie? I guess you all know about 2099. It's the new series we're doing, our heroes in the future, but they're not the, they're not the present heroes, they're different heroes. Except Dr. Doom, we don't quite know who he is. Is he today's Dr. Doom, who's managed to live that long? Is he another Dr. Doom? Is he a usurper, an interloper? Is he a robot? The reason I'm asking those questions is that we ourselves don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the others, the Punisher and uh, Spider-Man and Ravage, they're all new characters. The Spider-Man of the future, of course, is similar to our Spider-Man. You will find out how he becomes Spider-Man. I think the book should be arriving here. <laughs> the uh, Ravage book is the next one to go on sale, and I, I think the Punisher, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, Spider-Man, oh, you asked about Ravage. Ravage is the one that I'm writing, and it, in a way, it's a little bit different than the other three. He's a brand new character, aggravating the the world. They keep you awake at night. They stink. If they stink. If they hit you, you're dead, even if you're in an armored car. I mean, there's something to me very dramatic about a garbage truck, which shows that I'm not your average normal person. <laughs> anyway, that's his work. Now, as far as the tenor of the stories themselves, I've seen the artwork on Spider-Man and The Punisher and Doom, to old nine nine. And the strips are fantastic looking. They're wild far out, and there's a lot of action. There are incredible visuals you can't take your eyes away from. Ravage, I think, is a little bit different. It's drawn beautifully, magnificently, um, by Paul, 
I forgot his name. Was good. My best friend, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan, of course. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ryan fans. But he's terrific. He did a beautiful job. I couldn't have wanted anything better. But it's more down to earth. It's more realistic. And in a way, I get the feeling it reads a little more like the old Watchmen series, you know, where the panels were fairly even and the story just went along. And I'm very interested in finding out whether it'll, in today's, for today's audience, which really relates to this fantastic artwork, this eye-catching uh, Todd McFarlane type of artwork, whether something that's a little quieter, although beautifully drawn, will be as successful, or maybe more successful. It's going to be fun to find out. But I think and I hope you'll find that Ravage is a good read. Now, he doesn't even get his superpower until issue three. And when you see the superpower he gets, I think and I hope you'll be kind of surprised. And I hope me saying this will convince you to stay with the series until issue three and beyond. And I hope that I... Oh, the movie. You asked about the Spider-Man movie. Well, it's sort of an open secret, although I think the whole world knows it by now. But Jim Cameron is planning to write, direct, and produce Spider-Man, the movie. And the biggest problem we're having is he doesn't want the, the word Stanley presents to be much bigger than Jim <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you this, I've been thinking of changing my last name to Presents. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I'm incredibly excited about this. I mean, you all know Cameron, he did The Terminator and Aliens and uh, The Abyss. And, I mean, what he puts on the screen is just unbelievable. He, we met about a year ago at a party and he dragged me over to the corner and said, Stan, I want to do a Spider-Man movie more than anything I can I love that character. And I'm a very hard guy to influence. You. And I said, do it! <laughs> so it took a long time for all the lawyers and everybody to make the deal. Unfortunately, he has one movie he's contracted to do before he starts Spider-Man. I'm hoping he'll do it quickly. We hope to have the Spider-Man movie on the screen by 1995. And um, knowing Jim Cameron, It'll probably be a real blockbuster, right? There are a lot of decisions we have to make. Do we start with Spider-Man as a 17-year-old and have him grow during the movie? Do we keep him as a 17-year-old and in the sequel he's 18 and the next sequel he's 19? Do we start out with him married? I mean, there's so many things that we have to consider. It's going to be a lot of fun working with this. Have you got any idea who the main villain's going to be? We're hoping uh, to have, we've been talking about asking Arnold Schwarzenegger to be the villain. Um, and we want the whole cast to be name actors. Uh, only one exception. I have a favorite choice to play J. J. Jumping Jameson. Modestly. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just can't guess who you need. I'm going to tell you a funny story. Just take a minute. Do you have a show here called Pebble Mill at Noon? Or you used to have it? Yes, I wanted to do the one. Yeah. I was on it a million years ago as a guest, and the fellow who was the host, I don't remember his name, he was a big Spider-Man fan. He said, let's do a skit. I've got a Spider-Man costume, and we'll end with a skit. You be Jonah Jameson, we'll talk. So we did. I was Jonah Jameson, he was Spider-Man. The audience was hysterical. It worked beautifully. And I said, wow, I'm going to get a videotape of this, and if ever we do a movie, I'm going to show the tape, and it will be my audition reel. <laughs> well, when I got back to the States, I realized I never got the tape, and I phoned. And I said, you got to send me a tape. And he said, we don't keep tapes. And I never got a tape of it. And if by one chance in a million, any of you saw it, the tape <laughs> Okay. Please stand up to it. Anybody else has another question? No. I did get the question. I think the question was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, do you think the move of several artists from Marvel to image comics is good for the industry or good in any way for Marvel? I don't know if it's good or bad, but I think it's a very natural thing. They're all friends of mine. 
I think what they did is perfectly valid. It's in order. I wish them luck. Um, someday, some of them will come back to Marvel. Someday, other Marvel artists will. This is, this is the nature of the beast. It happens all the time. It happens in every business. When, when you work for a company, you're not an indentured slave. You have the right to go somewhere else if you think you can do better. Uh, the thing that amazes me is the people at Marvel, Tom and his staff, it seems that they can get wonderful artists all the time. Whenever an artist leaves a script, I see the next issue of the book and it's just as good or better. And I continually see names of artists I've never heard of before and they're great. One of the things that's been happening in the industry, comics have become so big that people who in the past weren't interested in working for comics, they now want to work for comics. So we continually get great artists, terrific writers, and when I was handling the books, it was very tough to find a good new artist or a good new writer. But now they're proliferating, which is good. But to answer your question, I, I wish them much luck. I hope they do well. It's good for the industry. The better our competitors are, the better we have to be. We all work harder, and the only ones who profit are you, readers. Uh, young man, yes, hand up. Will there ever be a series where the smart man of the future of the current world lives? Will there be a series where Spider Man of the Future what? Where Spider Man of the Future meets the Spider Man of the present? Hey, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that it's been planned yet. But the thing is, our editors have inquisitive minds just like you, and the chances are they're already discussing it. I haven't been back there for a while, so I don't know, but my guess is sooner or later somebody is going to think to do a story like that. It ought to be great. What Stan means is you've just given him a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the credit. <laughs> Gentlemen, you're in black chair. Well, I've never really been away from writing. I mean, I still write the uh, Spider-Man newspaper strip, which is, I guess, in, in over 500 papers around the world, and that's seven days a week. And I write a lot of occasional scripts for Marvel, you know, stories, uh, and a book here, a book there, whenever they're nice enough to ask me to write one, I like to keep doing it. And Ravage wasn't my decision. I was asked if I would do one of it. No, I know what happened. <laughs> I think the whole idea of doing the new universe was kind of my idea. I thought we well, ought to come up with a whole new group of characters, but I didn't want to do it the way it had been done a few years ago. You remember the new Marvel unit, the new universe we tried? I think the thing that was wrong with that was it had nothing to do with Marvel. It could have been published by anybody, just a group of new books. But I always thought the basic idea was a good one, so why don't we do a new universe, but let it tie in with Marvel? So I thought I would produce that in Los Angeles, where I was living, get a bunch of artists, and kind of work long distance with the guys in New York. But then I found I was too busy, I just couldn't do it. So Tom DeFalco was nice enough to say he would edit it there, and then I was asked if I would write one of the books. I don't have time to, but I couldn't say no. So, so far I've written two issues and I'm starting to write the third. And I will keep doing it as long as I have time. I may have to stop, but I'm enjoying it, so I'm going to try to do it as well. Can I call the question here? Are you doing it Marvel style? Are you finding a plot to pull what I am getting the book? The style yeah. of Pioneer? I, I, I talk about the plot to Paul Ryan and uh, to our editor. Um, and, and I um, and then Paul draws it. Joey Cavalera, that's the other And Paul draws it, and then I get the artwork and I put in the copy. And it, it's funny. I gave him a plot for one issue, but I crammed so much plot in there that he's stretching it out for four issues. Bless him. So he <laughs> don't have to write another plot till the fifth, fifth issue. I love that. He's writing plots. Okay, we've got to answer what You did it. Okay. Gentlemen, here with the jacket. Of all the stories that you've written, which do you look back on with most affection and pride and why? I don't know. I never really. You know what happens, really? Every so often, I'll look at an old book, and for some, somebody may ask me to sign a book, and he puts it in front of me, and it'll 
would be a book 20 years ago or so. And I'll say, gee, this looks good. And they went, oh, that's terrific. Who wrote it? Well, it's my name. I forgot about it. You know? Say, did I write that? Boy, I really was good. So at, <laughs> at that moment, that's my favorite story. Whatever. This is the most dangerous weapon. <laughs> Whatever story I'm, I'm looking at at the moment is my favorite. I've written so many, I don't even know. And if I say which is my favorite, there'll be some I've forgotten that I probably like better. I'm not telling you. I think of all the series, though, the series that I probably like the best is the Silver Surface series I did with John Lucena, because I think he just illustrated them so beautifully, and I was able to write it in the real corny way that I love to write, with a lot of flowery language and silly things, and, uh, and it was very consistent. Those, I think it was 17 issues or something, they all form a really, I think, a really nice set, you know, um, like the encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Down in front. Oh, I hate to say this, but the question was what comics do I read? I really do not have time to read comics. You know, we publish over a hundred a month, and every month the guys in New York send me a stack of 100 titles. Now, the stack is this big. They also sent me the DC titles, the Dark Horse titles, the Image titles. So once a month, I don't even have time to talk to my wife usually, and suddenly I get these stacks of books, and I get this guilt feeling because I'm not reading them, so I try, between phone calls or something, I try to just thumb through the covers just so I can be familiar with what it is that we're publishing. And I look at the covers, occasionally a cover will look very exciting or unique or different. So I'll pick it up and thumb through the book because it caught my interest. But that's about the most I can do. And I'm always afraid when I come to these uh, conventions that somebody is going to say, at the last issue of the X-Men, how come Cable did this to that? And I didn't even know Cable was in that issue. In fact, I didn't know it was Cable. <laughs> Keep in touch with the big developments in the field. You mentioned the Watchmen. Did you read the Watchmen? Well, Did you read Dark Knight? I read selective things. Uh, the Watchmen, I look at Judge Dredd, I look at certain issues of ours, the, whatever the new issues, of course. I've got to have some familiarity with the field. But I no longer have the luxury of taking the comic book and sitting back and reading it and enjoying it. A Marvel comic, of course, you can't enjoy it. <laughs> I didn't mean it. Why does it happen? There are two. Oh, which do I prefer? I absolutely uh, can't answer that because there are some teams of writers and artists who do great work, and there are some people who write and draw their own things who are great. I think Frank Miller can write and draw the script as well as any artist and writer can. And there are a number of other people like that. I think that um, any number of writers teamed up with artists also do the work. It, it really depends. It, I, I don't think one is better than the other. Some artists are not able to write, so they team up with a good writer. Some writers can't draw, like me. Like, I draw a little bit, but not as good as these guys. So they have to work with an artist. Some guys can do a book. I think Todd McFarlane will turn out to be one of the best writer artists. I think he gets better with every script he does. Um, they get depends, really. Just not Back in the 60s, when you started the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, um, I was never an reader of comics. The one part which struck me about the actual comics was the artwork. It was that delivered by Jack Kirby, who had the faces grow uglier, you had the teeth showing, you had big ears, you had... And it made it more natural. It was a totally different artwork to DC or anything else which was on the same at that time. Was that deliberate to make the reader sit up? Or was it part of his actual, his artwork and his way he drew? Just give me the last point. The last was that deliberate? Was it, was it deliberate? Uh, Jack, Jack Kirby's drawing was it deliberately distinctive and that he drew people a bit ugly with big teeth? Was it just the natural way that Paul drew them? No, that was Jack's natural style. Jack was one of the best. At, it still is, I guess, but 
Jack has the ability to make every panel he draws look exciting and to make everybody's expression interesting. Some artists will draw a strip where if a person is frightened, let's say, he'll look like this. Not very interesting. Jack will draw him like this. <laughs> and you want to look at him. Jack and I used to discuss that. I was also the art director, so I worked very closely with the artist in deciding how to draw them. Our policy, our formula, if you want to call it that, was the artist should exaggerate every action and every expression. And for example, if somebody is hitting somebody, an artist can draw a guy hitting somebody like this, perfectly fine, a lot of people hit somebody like that, or it could be wham, <laughs> where you twist the whole body. Well, obviously, the second way is more interesting to look at. I always used to say, if something is exciting, if something exciting is happening in the strip, and there's a crowd in the background watching it, you've got to have the people in the crowd looking like this. Oh, you know, let them look excited, because if the characters don't look excited, how can you convince the reader that this is something exciting? Well, Jack did that naturally. He didn't need any teaching. He it just came out of him. He was a genius at that. And artwork, I can't tell you how important the artwork is. Well, you, you must know it in a comic. For instance, with Dr. Doom, sometimes we have an artist who would draw Dr. Doom sitting in a chair, and he had him, he had him sit like this. Nothing wrong with a man sits in a chair like this. But I used to say, this is Dr. Doom. He's the most powerful villain in the world. He sits in a chair like this. <laughs> you know, hands on the arm. And uh, I'll tell you one more example of that. When you're an art director, you have to be like a movie director. There's a great similarity. For those of you who've seen the Hulk television series, the one mistake that nobody else seems to think of, the one thing that bothered me tremendously is they had the Hulk run. Now, you know, when he became the Hulk, he had those little shorty pants that grew out of his pants. And if he had to chase a villain, he'd run down the street. And there was big Wolverine over there, like that, which looked about as dramatic as I just looked. And I always used to say, for a movie of a guy like who's called the Hulk, when he chases somebody, he should lumber like that. He's not fast. Not for the movie, but he never gets tired. So the person who's <coughs> chasing thinks he's going to get away and runs fast. There's the Hulk coming after him, and eventually the guy who's running goes into a blind alley or something, and he has no escape. And there's the Hulk coming closer. Now that's scary, but it's <laughs> anyway, that's what an art director should be doing. Now we're running way over time. One more question. Over to you. Gentleman uh, right at the back with the comic in his hand. Okay. Um, can you tell me, why has Larry Stroman been taking up X Factor? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know he was on. <laughs> it was the wrong question. I'm sorry. Very fine. Wrong question. What's the guy in front of the set? Um, with so many non code comics around at the moment, do you think there is any need for the Comics Code Authority? Good question. I really don't know. I. Um, <laughs> I wasn't even sure. Are we still using the authority? Do we still have it? Yeah. <laughs> and I, it never bothered me when I did the books because I always felt that our books weren't that sexy, they weren't that violent, and the code was no problem. <clears throat> I don't know because so many, as you say, so many of the books don't follow the code anyway. They're for mature <laughs> readers. I think the publishers must feel there's some advantage to having the seal there, but I don't think anybody pays much attention to it, really. Um, well, let me say this. If you people have enjoyed this half as much as I have, you've had a hell of a good time, and I want to congratulate you. You've been a wonderful audience. I thank you very much.